So we talk a lot about the grower movement in Champagne, and uh, no figure dominates that discussion more than Anselm Salas. But sometimes I think that, uh, even though it's a term I use myself, we really ought to talk more about a revolution in viticulture to do with picking lower yields, riper grapes, living soils, and then a renaissance in artisanal winemaking, rather than a grower revolution, because in fact there have been grower bottle champagnes since um, the late 19th century. And that was really something that Salos pioneered in the 1970s, but in fact his visibility is such that he almost excludes other pioneers from the picture. Because in fact, people like Francis Aigley and later Pierre Lamondier didn't really know what Salas was doing in Avis, and they started doing similar things shortly after in their own villages, and uh, they also deserve a, a share of the credit, I'd say, for uh, the changes that have taken place and are continuing to take place in Champagne today. I think also sometimes the trade and even the media use uh, Salas's influence as a shorthand to talk about his disciples, people who've been um, touched by his uh, ideas, sometimes to the exclusion of their originality and, and the ideas that those people have developed themselves. So, you know, often hear such and such work at Salas as if that in itself suffices to explain why a wine is worth buying or an estate is worth following. Equally, though, uh, tasting through the new releases from Salas, which are really breathtaking wines, uh, this is a 2009 vintage that I'm drinking right now. Uh, I'm struck by, for all uh, his visibility and his dominance of the discourse about Gros Champagne, Salos is, in some respects, relatively poorly understood. Uh, uh, he often is discussed in terms of oxidative winemaking and being controversial, divisive wines. Some people love them, some people don't. Uh, Salos himself, I don't think, really cares. He's not interested in making a globalized product for a mass audience. He's interested in making really niche wines for a small number of people who appreciate them, and he succeeds very well on those terms. Um, but in fact, uh, the really distinctive aspect of Salas's winemaking for me is not so much the so-called oxidative dimension, uh, because while the barrels are um, not very firmly closed during the, the élevage, uh, I don't think it's actually as aggressively oxidative as people make out. In fact, what's really distinctive is that after late November or December, Salas no longer tops up the wines. Rather than being to do with oxidation, that's actually about uh, allowing, come springtime, a layer of floor, or in Jura we'd say a veil of yeast, um, to, to grow on the surface of the wine. So what's going on is not so much oxidation as biological aging, just as you'd find in the Tipe wines of the Jura and the wines of Jerez. To me, uh, this really gets at the, the true uh, originality of Salas, which is to challenge our conception of what champagne could be. And we talk a lot about terroir expression today in the wine world. We talk about it in Burgundy, in Champagne, uh, Piedmont, or uh, even in Jerez increasingly. And the irony is that in all of these different places, the uh, techniques which supposedly translate terroir into the glass are radically different, and in fact have a very strong imprint, especially if you look at biological aging. Um, so. I think we need to, in fact, reflect a little bit more transparently on the relationship between terroir and production. Uh, and is there an, any such thing as just uh, expressing without uh, any mediating influence the character of a given site? So lots of wines really pose those questions, and uh, it's a particularly revolutionary thing to do in Champagne, which, you know, unlike more, more so, let's say, than any other wine in France, is defined by technique.